hopefully you can see the cover slide there. But really, I often present, this is a cover image, and it's the image that I want to, I guess, the takeaway message to, to come out in my presentation today about the value of using finer soil particle size and fine soil fractions in exploration geochemistry. And it may seem strange to have a, a picture of a football field and relate it to soil geochemistry, but hopefully as we go through this presentation, you'll understand where I'm going with that um, and why it's important. It doesn't have to be Optus Oval as, as this state, it could be any, any football field, uh, but you'll see as we go through why, why that's um, important. And Optus Stadium is obviously quite close to, to where I am. And be, while I will talk mainly about uh, fine soil fractions, and in particular, uh, something that uh, CSRO has developed myself with my team called Ultrafine um, Plus, uh, that will be the, I guess, the centre of my talk and most of the latter part where I think we're going with um, exploration geochemistry and how we can advance it. I want to acknowledge right up front that, you know, it doesn't work everywhere. It's not uh, one of these silver bullet type approaches there are and I would recommend you know horses for courses and coarse soil fractions in in some settings can be very effective so uh, a good example I've got there the bronze wing discovery in the Yandel belt was uh, was done with pisoliths and near surface again fairly residual type soil settings but in that region if you understood that there'd be no reason to go to a fine soil fraction. You know, when you have something that you know works very effectively, uh, use it. Don't, don't switch, switch tracks just because you've heard, you know, this presentation or some other, other thing touting how good it, it could be. Um, it's all about understanding your site and your setting. Where I think, uh, and hopefully you'll see as we go through this, where I think we add value is making it easier to interpret your geochemistry and also making it easier to understand your landscape and your setting um, without perhaps being you know an expert in in regular geochemistry so i would say know your site is really important so orientation work is always uh, valuable and you know the little plot down the side there i think is of i think that's from kalahari sands actually in africa you know where you know if you're looking for for perhaps lead uh, the fine fraction is obviously giving a much stronger signal, signal in the less than two microns. But you know, most in this case, they were looking for, for copper. And you know, that medium-sized fraction and the sand size fraction was actually quite, quite an effective particle size uh, to work with in that environment. And the other thing that you know, I would say up front is, is marry the, the best sample media with your analytical technique. Um, and I, I pinched this from one of Nick Oliver's short courses where he talks about combining, I think it's assays actually with the right instrumentation. Uh, so, you know, picking the wrong instrumentation, you get the, the Mr. Bean across the poor sample media. So this is the, the coarse or just sand size fraction in, in this example, mainly. Um, you know, you are going to get the, the Mr. Bean type geochemistry with, you know, something that's, that's probably, um, quite comical in many respects, because you're not going to get the, um, although you know, it might be quite sad also that you're not getting the value out of your re, uh, sampling and analysis. And, you know, Nick talks about, you know, the what you really want in the Hollywood setting is something like George Clooney and his Corvette. You know, you, you pick the right instrumentation, you pick, you know, uh, uh, the best sample media you can work with in that setting. And so this ties into that orientation type work that I mentioned. So understanding, you know, where you where you get your Corvette from, or which you know which uh, vehicle you're you're looking for, is is important right up front to get that sort of high quality geochemistry results. And I think in the past we've kind of been a bit stuck in our ways. Um, and he also reflects on if you mix these up, you're also going to get poor quality poorer quality results. So you know picking the best size fraction, and so maybe the the ultra fine soil fraction is really good, but if you're measuring it with the wrong instrument or using a, a lab that doesn't have good QAQC and all these other things that you need to consider, then you're, you're still going to get a really poor quality result, not what you're looking for. And the, you know, the opposite of that is, you know, having the best instrumentation and labs, but picking the poorest sample media, 
you're st- you're going to get reasonable geochemistry. chemistry. You get George there with some sort of vehicle that, that works, but it's not nearly the slick sort of geochemistry that you're looking for in your results. And I would argue, and I'll, I'll sort of show a bit of an example of that I think over the last 20 years, we've kind of been a bit stuck in this space where we've kind of got on this, you know, we do soil chemistry and we, we separate out the standard, you know, less than 250 or less than 180. I think that's the 60 and 80 mesh sort of samples. And we assay it for, you know, 30 or 40 elements. And that's not really been questioned, sort of why, how we can improve it and whether there's reasons that we would want to be improving that. And that leads me to another uh, image that I use quite often when I introduce this topic. And that's the FOMS. Um, and there's the idiom uh, that some of you may be familiar with. It's called jumping the shark. And it actually comes back to this exact scene in Happy Days for some of you older viewers that, that may recall that, that show. Um, and where that comes from is basically the producers of the show were watching the ratings of Happy Days decline. And so what they did was just pretty much arm wave bigger and bigger. Think of the bigger, you know, more, more outlandish things that the Fonz could do. And in this case, they, they took him on a water ski and he literally did jump a shark that was in the, the, the Californian Bay area. And so it was just ridiculous over the top the show continued to tank and it didn't give any benefit and i think with a lot of the surface geochemistry over the last few years i think there's been a bit of this arm waving with techniques and saying you know this method can see through 100 meters of cover or 150 meters of cover i've seen in presentations and websites and there may be select environments where that does work but I think often what it does is we, we, we kind of jump the shark in terms of making these claims without having the science and fundamentals to back up or even the understanding of the mechanisms. So I, I won't talk too much about the mechanisms of metal migration, but it's really important to understand where, where your anomaly might come from and how it might get through that thick cover. You know, if, if you've got thick cover and you can't make a case for how an anomaly might get up to, towards the surface, then surface geochemistry is not really going to work for you. Um, and I think uh, Mark Arundel also gives a presentation around this where he talks about the value in the shallows. And I, I firmly believe that in that there's a lot of areas in Australia and actually globally where we might have two to 20 or even 30 metres of cover. So, you know, I wouldn't consider that too too thick and it's shallow cover where there's a lot of potential for buried mineralization that we haven't explored very effectively and i think that's where the real issue opportunity is for surface geochemistry in particular working towards the finer soil fractions which ties into some of the earlier research we did at, at csro as part of the amara p778 um, project series led by um, dr ravi nand and I was part of his team there. And one of the things that we did just out the back of the building here was take um, all material, bury it, and try and study how the material was moving through that environment. We also set up some lab experiments right, be, right behind me here in, in the lab uh, where we souped up this same type of environment and like had heat lamps and fluctuated the water tables in those columns and looked at how those metals were moving through it. And what we found was that you can generate surface anomalies really quite quickly um, and really to quite a a high concentration uh, if you have the right environment. And what we found from these studies, so on the left here, uh, I'll just get my laser pointer. What we have on the left here is a buried uh, kid play pool. We put the ore in there and we had in some t- times we had some sampling devices running down into them and surface measuring things. Um, and then we backfilled it and then we started monitoring over the surface. And what we found that was really quite remarkable was within seven months, we could actually detect gold above the buried gold ore. Uh, we could b- detect VMS, uh, zinc, copper above the buried VMS ore from Jaguar, which, which had those elements in it. Now, there were some sites where it didn't work. And what we found was that when we drilled holes in these these, um, plastic trays and allowed 
the surface water to just percolate down, we lost our geochemical signature. And you know, what was happening is there was weathering of that ore material, but it was just washing down and further deep, deeper into the cover. So we weren't getting anything at surface. Where we had no um, porosity in that pool, and we had what we effectively had was a seasonally perched water table, that was where we got seasonal signatures near the surface. So we were getting that evapotranspiration, some of the, you know, the plants were interacting with that, moving up towards the surface. So there was mechanisms moving those metals near the surface through sand dunes, two metres in seven months. Uh, and that continued over quite a few years. Now, what that led me to believe in particular was what sort of, what sort of um, uh, species or what sort of environments are the metals that we're interested in? What are they moving to? How are they moving? And really, they're likely to be small. Um, they're likely to be mobile and they're likely to be ionic and charged. And we'll come back to why you know, that links into the fine soil particle size fraction and analysis and making that sort of step change uh, in, in, in the near future. But I want to go right back to the start, and this is around the time we were running those experiments and the origin of, of the ultrafine soil survey um, and where it really come from. And for some of you out there, and I hope you're either mentors or mentees for some of the junior uh, explorers, it's really valuable to have those relationships. And where my journey on looking at the fine soil fractions in particular, it, it came from some of those pit experiments and working with um, Ravi and and co, but it also came from this place, which was uh, the Picos de Europa in Northern Spain. And it was on a bus trip there where I was um, at, a, at a, a geochemistry conference and I was sitting next to Paul Morris, who's the uh, recently retired chief geochemist for the Geological Survey of Western Australia. And it was one of those times where, you know, he was someone that somewhat mentored me, but also took the time to engage with some of the younger uh, researchers and provoke questions out of them. That's really what he did. And he turned around to me on the bus. He was talking about his, the GSWA surveys and where they were working in some sand dune country uh, in particular. And his question was really quite simple he, he just asked me he was like what size fraction do you think we should be working with you know they had their standard methods and they hadn't really changed too much and it was that moment that I and I just said I think the smaller the better and I didn't really think about how small until a bit later but it came back to really that point of time where we started and so Paul and I then worked with a student researcher at CSIRO and he said, here's some samples I have from sand dune country in, in the back blocks of WA. It doesn't have a lot of gold in it. In fact, most of it's below detection, but we've got a few that do. Um, can we look at, you know, how do we understand these samples better? And so what we did, um, myself and the student, um, Marco Cavalieri, we separated out the finest fractions we could. So we didn't just separate out the clays, so down to about two micron by definition. We separated out sub two micron, down to 0.2 micron, in fact. And we looked at, you know, the gold concentrations within those. And what we found was that most of the gold in those transported sands was in that fine material. So, you know, the 0.2 and 2 micron fractions. And then there was a little bit in the silt size fraction as well. So this is that fine dry sieve. You might get to about minus 63 microns. Contains some of the gold, but by and large, most of it's here. What was, you know, most important was that most of the gold, most of the sample you're collecting is, is this bulk material. It's, it's coarse. It has almost very little exchange capacity. And so what that means is so... You're, you know, you're really getting very little value out of the bulk of what you're collecting. So when you're sending in your two kilos worth of material, 1.995 or 1.95 kilos of that material is pretty much rubbish and you're not getting any information out of it for trace metals and particularly gold and copper and zinc. And when we looked at some of these materials under SEM, and this is, this is actually from residual soil, we see these populations of gold and they make up the vast quantity of gold concentration within that even though you know they're all very small nanometer populations um, that's where the bulk of the gold is in this and so it's that fine material that's being mobilized around and you'll see there the clays 
example, which brings me back to the image of the football field, because that five to 800 metres of surface area is much more likely something like the football field. So if I had a handful of soil in my, in my hand for an exploration project, if that was clay, the surface area of that, um, that handful of soil is something like a football field. Whereas if that surface, if that same handful of soil is mostly sand, quartz, the surface area is barely bigger than you know, the desk that I'm sitting in, certainly no bigger than the office space um, that I'm in. And when you think about that, and you think back to those soil experiments that we started with, when they were mobilizing metals up through sand dune materials, you know, those materials, the little charged particles, they're looking for surfaces to connect with and bind. Um, and this comes back to, you know, my early days um, doing a lot of work in soil agriculture and looking at clays and absorption. And, you know, so they're looking for large surface areas. Uh, well, they're pretty clearly going to be the football oval equivalent, the, the clays and the iron oxides um, and to a lesser extent some of the organics perhaps that have big surface areas and big exchange capacity compared to the, the quartz sand that you're picking up. And that's what really drove us to develop the technique further was to say, well, let's refine our sample media to benefit from that. And there were a couple of other things that, that really were already published about this as well. Uh, and refer to gold nuggets and how they can be really problematic. And um, Dennis Arne presents this in, in his in Explore paper, I think it's uh, 2014. Um, I think I might reference it in the next slide. But anyway, he looks at the Geological Survey of Canada, uh, no, Yukon Geological Survey, where they do a really large survey of a couple of thousand samples over an area that they thought was prospective at the time, very little exploration activity in this area. When they reassayed those same soil samples, and this was like bulk material, this was the, their duplicate analysis. It's a complete scattergun. And so what that led to was that the gold results in particular were considered a waste of time. No one had any confidence in, the, in those results. Um, and in particular concerning was what I call the sort of oh crap zone, where, you know, if either you miss a, a nugget um, because you get below detection and don't reassay, or you get a really big value, um, you know, maybe it's up in the PPM range, you reassay that sample and you get below detection. Instantly, you're thinking, you know, could be a nugget, but you could also be thinking, oh, the lab's made a mistake. This is, a, you know, all our assays are rubbish. It's really hard to have confidence in that, in that data when you do that. So for this example, this was in 2003, nothing happened in exploration space for another five years, even though the survey had done this work until another company came in and did, they were doing um, overbanks or the sediments and soils. Uh, and they did better quality analysis on that. And they found the coffee deposit and opened up that whole area. So nuggets are not really valuable for our exploration. Now, Dennis Arne went back to these same samples and, and Bill McFarlane and took some of those same materials compared a couple of different techniques, but what they did was also compare the clay analysis. And what they found was that while they lost the nuggets, they gained confidence in the data because they could reproduce those geochemical results. So your 40 PPB gold assay came back as 37 the next time. All of a sudden you now really feel more confident about the samples. And that's the value of the clay size fraction. You lose your big anomalies in some ways, but you get confidence and you get reproducibility. So that's really important. And that was sort of what we tied into it, the early work here. And this is a poor quality slide, but this is actually published, these, um, these materials. And I've got a QR code link in the presentation and it's right at the end. So you can, you can link to those, those, these publications and get more information. But we wanted to know how this would work in WA soils in particular. So we've got reference soils from historical samples, and it wasn't just over mineralization, it was over a broad range of areas. So we've got background type regions, and we looked at the gold in those size fractions. We looked at copper and other elements too. And what we found that was that while the less than two micron makes up a very small percentage of these, some of these, you know, Bentley, Boddington, De Brucey, you can see some of the, the um, Tropicana with some of the areas we worked in. When you actually look at the gold in those fractions, all right, you start to see that most of it is in the clays and the what I would say the 
you know, silt size fraction. So that fine material really hosts a lot of that information that we're really um, wanting to see. We also looked at refining the technique. So we looked at, you know, how much sample do you actually need? And what we found was that, you know, you don't need to collect two kilos of sample. We actually, we actually assay 20 grams uh, or 40 grams if, it's, if it can be a problematic um, sample. So really, there was no value in collecting huge quantities of soil and transporting. And we could reproduce right down to 0.1 of the gram. We weren't seeing any significant differences with the gold um, in the assays. We did see minor changes in some of the pathfinder elements. Uh, and what these typically came out as, they weren't highly different, um, but they were slightly different. It was when we had organic rich soil, so things like Boddington or clay poor soils where they were really problematic to get out. And this was, you know, five, six years ago now. We've really spent a lot of time working closely with the commercial lab partner to improve that. And so we don't see even those differences anymore. But there's subtleties there. One of the things we do see um, is a big increase in the concentration. So we Im improve the amount of gold we collect by restricting down to those fine soil fractions. All of a sudden we get rid of the diluting quartz and all that bulk stuff that I sort of said doesn't really add a lot of value. And we, we get um, greater concentrations, which has a good effect on not getting many samples below detection um, for gold. And here you see a comparison of about, you know, nearly 2,000 samples, same samples compared with uh, a traditional aqua regia result. So this, again, it's you're using the same extraction, but you're not using the fine finer fractions. So you can see there's an increase in using the fines. And for us, it doesn't really work for gold. But, you know, when you think about other elements you might be interested in, zinc uh, is one example. The four acid does better uh, than aqua regia, but it doesn't actually perform better than you know, the ultra fine uh, microwave digestion, aqua regia extraction that we use in the, in the technique. So you're not, it's designed for gold particularly, but we're not losing value chasing copper and zinc. Where we potentially might lose a little bit of value is in some of the resistate metals. So the uh, resistate elements, so tungsten would be a good example. Um, however, when you actually look closely, the tungsten, you know, has slightly greater concentrations, but you know, we still pick the same sort of anomalous samples. And so we've done a bit of background work in this. There's more to come on this. Uh, if you were just chasing tungsten and tin, maybe I would recommend a four acid approach and potentially of course a fraction, but you're not actually losing out uh, too much by using the, the fine soil fractions. And we've done a lot of background work on this. So we've looked at comparison to uh, ALS's clay size separation technique, which you have to send your samples to Canada for at the moment to do. Uh, and there's a strong correlation. And not surprising, they're doing the exact same thing we do in the ultra fine technique. We separate out the clays and we assay them. But there is a big differences and you'll see those coming up uh, soon. We also compare it to things like mobile metal iron, which doesn't look for fine soil fractions, but it looks for loosely absorbed metals. So it looks at the exchange processes as well. Um, maybe a little bit, trying to do this aiming at the same phase with a different approach. Um, and what we see is there is a correlation with gold, although the, you can see on the axis there, the ultra fine produces, you know, 60 PPB gold, whereas MMI is at, at about 15 on that line. So we get a lot more gold out. We get a lot more copper uh, in particular, and the correlations start to drop off with some of the elements with the MMI, which only has, um, has a much more limited range, whereas ultra fine, we report 52 or 51 elements at the moment as part of that package. And I'll touch on that in, in just a minute. So really most of the commercial labs are now offering a, a fine fraction. It might be a dry, you know, sieve less than 63 micron. You know, that's not bad. I think it's, it's pretty close to the sort of George Clooney Corvette style. Um, analytical, analytically, all the labs are very good now. What we do with the ultra fine though, is do that same thing on the on the clay size fraction, but we're starting we package in more information, and this was something that I was really driven early around was trying to find how we get more information. So, you know, things like pH and conductivity of those soils, pH we know influences chemistry greatly, but we don't measure it in the soil. So, when we're trying to evaluate geochemical results, you know, it 
would be nice to know the, the soil pH. Well, we now report that as part of the technique. So we bolted on all these other bits of information. And I'd say when we bolted them on, we weren't really sure how all of them would add value. And I think we're still in that phase where we're trying to understand the value behind quite a bit of that. So, you know, the particle size distribution is useful. Uh, and, you know, you might equivalent, quiff, make that equivalent to Leonardo DiCaprio in his sports car or Hugh Jackman. You know, we're adding all these extra bits of information. So here we're adding spectral mineralogy as well. So both uh, visible and near infrared has been packaged up in the standard Ultrafine uh, Plus offering. And now we're also recording FTIR, which I don't, I might have a little bit to show it towards the end of the presentation. Um, but that's not the standard commercial offering, but it will be uh, very soon. So, you know, we're putting in all this information. Some of it, we're not really sure how we work with it. And I would argue, you know, Justin Bieber here in his Lamborghini is, is the sort of information that people of my generation and perhaps older aren't very familiar with, with Justin Bieber. Uh, and we're not quite understanding how we perhaps might use some of the spectral mineralogy information in our geochemistry. But the next generation is much more comfortable with this. They understand using big data. They understand interoperability of data types. Machine learning isn't really foreign. You know, so we're trying to develop the method that will capture most of the information we want and also make it, you know, um, very adaptable into future generations. And here's just an example that I use quite often comparing uh, a geological survey of Western Australia survey result in the northeast Yilgarn. Uh, and this was, you know, 300 samples with only a, a small percentage of them uh, returning detectable gold. We revisited the, the survey uh, and reassayed those exact same soils with the ultrafine technique. So again, looking, you know, to put the Corvette into this analytical package. And this was the map that was produced. And you can see that all of a sudden, you know, the only known, the only mine in the area Mount Eureka is picked out. And this is on a pretty broad, this is on four kilometer spacing or something. So you're not expecting really detailed targets, but you're picking out trends. And here you can see, you know, the gold clearly picks out the trends in the in the mafic, ultra matrix, possibly extending up undercover. So it's giving you more information. That's just the gold results. We're not even factoring in all the multi-element space. We're not even factoring in things like understanding pH or spectral mineralogy. So there's a a vast amount more information we can get out of uh, the new package and the new sort of techniques. The other benefit that I've found by separating out the fine soil fractions is that we're not as restricted by soil morphology. Uh, and this was something that I'd worked on for quite a few years was looking at sampling depths and understanding, you know, whether you're in an A or a B or a C horizon in your soil morphology. How does that influence your chemistry? You know, so, you know, do you, you know, trust your field crew to go out and be able to identify soil horizons when they're sampling? You know, probably not as critical in some areas of Western Australia, but certainly really critical if you're in Eastern parts of Australia and other parts of the world. What we find with, by separating out the fine soil clay uh, content is that it's not as limited. So what, even though we might have, much less clay in the upper parts of the horizon, we're still pulling out the clay. When we get deeper in the profile and it's clay rich horizon, we're still pulling out the clay and analyzing it. So we're comparing apples and apples. And in the past, what we've been doing is comparing a sandy soil and diluting the signature with you know, more clay rich soil, which has a stronger um, analytical you know, trace element uh, component. And so instantly, if you get more clay, that's your bigger target or your bigger your anomaly. And it's not really related to anything uh, about mineralization. And so here's a couple of examples I've presented previously where the, you know, the target, this is gold through this region. And you see it, uh, they compared a number of techniques. We did part of the CSRO um, study. Uh, and it picks up at, at multiple depths in the, in the ultrafine fraction. It doesn't pick it up when you do coarser size fractions. It didn't pick it up when we did biogeochemistry. Uh, there was much more variation in it. And even one of the sites that I've spent a lot of time working on is the North Mitel Nickel uh, site, which was blind at surface. But when you got down into that sort of interface zone where the clay starts to pick up, you actually get a subtle nickel signature above the ore zone. 
Um, and it relates, and we've done profile work, detailed hydrogeochemistry, a whole range of things at this site. Um, and it's linked to the, the residual weathering nickel below, um, not necessarily related to the mineralization, but certainly an enriched nickel at the, in the residual saprolite. And you do pick it up when you look at separating out the clay size fractions, whereas you would miss it if you're separating the surface soils only um, without understanding that environment really well. So, you know, what we did was develop a technique and that has, you know, no issues with nugget effect. It concentrates a lot of base metals uh, and target metals. It uh, reduces below detection and it accounts for a lot of soil changes in soil properties, which is really valuable. And none of this was really amazing or new information. It was just packaged up where it was easy to use. Um, and then we commercialized that with LabWest, who is the commercial partner for us uh, and, and offers this as a, as a standard analytical technique now. Um, I'll put the QR code in there because that links to the UltraFine, the CSRO UltraFine website. And from there, you can get information, like you can get links to these papers, journal papers, you can get linked to that GSWA's report and some of the newer information that's coming out as well um, from the Northern Territory. We've done a report there as well recently. So there's all sorts of new materials there and a lot more background, frequently asked questions and that sort of thing. But now what I really wanted to talk about is the next steps and where we've gone with this. And uh, this is a picture of Thomas Kuhn who uh, wrote the structure of scientific revol revolutions in 1962. But what he really talked about was a uh, paradigm shift. He, he coined that phrase. Um, and I'm not sure where it's a paradigm shift, but it is, and they use this Wittgenstein diagram as a really good demonstration of that. And what I think we have changed our view on is how we re re view our geochemical results. And so I think for many decades, we've been looking maybe at, from the left-hand side of this diagram and saying, you know, it looks like a duck. And we've started to say, well, maybe we should look at this differently. Look at these other parameters. Look at the information that we, we haven't been capturing and how that helps us interpret better. And so, you know, that's the sort of thing that I think is more rabbit geochemistry. So whether you uh, see from which side of this diagram. And that's the shift that I think we're going to. I don't necessarily think it's a, it's a, a, a paradigm shift. It's just an adaption of the way we're working. But I like that diagram as a reminder of, of where we're going. And so the next phase of this work is around the next gen analytics. So it's how do we interpret that, those results better? So we combine the soil analysis, we combine spatial data, and we start doing machine learning on it. And we make all the product that we're producing on the other side much more easier to interpret. That's really what it's about. It's not about trying to do some amazing, you know, highfalutin' machine learning that only a select few can understand. It's actually about packaging it up so people can use it. And that's what we've done. And I'm, I'll gloss over the first couple of points and, and spend a bit more time on the last one. So, you know, one of the things we do is now as part of this, and it's not available to everyone yet, but project partners are doing this, uh, it automates QAQC. So when you submit um, CRMs and certain CRMs and duplicates, it gives a report back instantly in traffic like colors that you can see how your assays are performing. And we've got a whole bunch of rules around how they work and it works for some of the spectral data as well. It's not just geochemistry. So you can quickly glance at your data pack and go, okay, that's that's pretty good. Um, you know, I need to be careful with my you know, zinc results because they're, they're showing more variance than I expect. You know, that's the sort of information you've got straight away. Click, click of a button. The other thing that we output is all the data comes back in maps PNG, so you can quickly look through the, the images, shape files, so you can quickly drag them into your GIS package and produce even better maps. And all this is really done so it's easy to use. We put it in landscape context, and I think that's probably one of the more important factors. And you'll see that in the, in the coming up examples. And then we've got something called the DSO, Digital Sample Observer, and that's a really easy way to view your um, results. And so landscape context is where I think we will make the biggest inroads quickly in, in this environment. And so we've got, um, you know, this sort of typical landform where you might have your survey points and you can see that you're sampling on a grid, you're sampling over very many different environments. And so, you know, you're likely to pick up, you know, this deposit or this mineralization showing because it's sitting in a residual setting. 
However, the other ones you've got are probably unlikely to be picked up and I'll show how we work around that. So you've got very different environments and different cover sequences. Now what we've done uh, as the, the team really, we've looked at packaging up spatial data layers and interpreting that as a, you know, a landscape output. It's not quite a regolith map, but it does relate to regolith maps when we do the ground truthing. It relates to sufficient environments and depth and cover. So that's the other thing. We put in a cover depth estimator, which is this um, valley bottom flatness index, because where the cover gets really thick, that's where you want to be looking for more subtle geochemical anomalies. And so you can see the output there from the various spatial learning. Um, special um, data sets. And here's another example where you can see the input um, layers and the output clustered landscapes. Now, this is one of our early ones, and you can see how that relates to the satellite imagery. When you look at a traditional regolith map, there's not a lot of information there that you can start separating out your samples. So if you've got a grid over here and you might have you know, uh, 30 samples, you might have 300, you know, can you package them up into different landscapes? And, you know, you've got three units there in the traditional regular map, but it's really not a lot of information. Now, why we think this is really valuable is because you can do more things like interpret your anomalies. So here's copper results for the whole population of a survey. And what you're going to find is these are your standard targets. So these are anomalous by definition. Uh, and they're also, this is a residual soil unit. And so that picks up this area in, in this survey quite, quite well. But that's the stuff you're going to find. What you're going to overlook is the more subtle copper anomalies. And these are clearly anomalies in that landscape compared to the bulk of the, the geochemical results. But they're very low concentrations. And so now we're making those easier to interpret and see. And you can see them sitting all up here in the cover sequence. And also you see a couple of blue ones behind there. So where there's a little bit of cover, you're in a pretty hot zone there for your copper targeting, but you probably wouldn't have got into this area. Some other things that we've packaged up, and here's another uh, example the New South Wales surveys uh, about to release in, in a report, is um, looking at dispersion directions and source directions. So we output that as part of the package as well, where we look at the landscape information and say, well, where is this signature likely to have come from? Uh, each of these is a per point. So you can see that the anomalous results here are pointing towards the, the um, Federation deposit. And likewise, this is the general dispersion direction. So this is broad scale type direction. So, you know, if you have a deposit here, the dispersion direction is down slope. So that's kind of where you'd be hoping for a geochemical signature. And you actually find one here where, you know, you've got a bit of cover. You know, so helping you target better and more effectively. And I've thrown this one in because it just demonstrates where we're going with a lot of our thinking on this. So we're trying to package up stuff and make it easy. Uh, so we output principal components, for example, so multi-element indices and things like that, where you can quickly, you know, you might pick principal component three as being important because it hosts gold, um, vanadium, arsenic, Tungsten, you know, it's one of the, you know, that's the pathfinder element you're interested in, uh, zinc, and then you get a plot for that and a shape file and you can quickly drag and plot it. Uh, and that's also showing us, you know, differences with the soil particle size. So you can actually see where your environment is changing um, in your landscape. You can see where the pH is changing in the, in the plots. These are older plots. They're a bit more um, nice and produced in these early maps. And likewise with the spectral mineralogy, sometimes you might find, um, something unusual in this in the mineral spectrum that's saying this is this this sample stands out and you know it may not be linked to mineralization but what we want you guys to start to do is look at the results and say well actually I can under, those are unusual samples so I can work on that um, you know these are standard targets I've colored these dots by uh, PGE this is a PGE's kind of exploration effort and all of these samples are brightly colored because they sit up up in the landscape where they're in the depositional settings, they're grey, they're not so exciting. But if you start to look at them, these are the ones that stand out from the rest of the population. These are those unusual potential targets. And that's all we're really trying to do is change the way we're thinking about our geochemistry. And we're still working through that. Um, and one of the most exciting things is, and is the simple way in trying to view this. And this is the digital sample observer. Here you see 
specifically the spatial input layers that produces a clustering map. So this is a very big survey. You'll see that in a minute. And this is why I'm not trying to run it live off a web server um, because it just goes very slowly. This, these are just snapshots from, from the, the web viewer. And you can see here, you've got a couple other layers. Um, this is the, the model it produces. These are the surface geology maps from the surveys that we sort of bring in. And then you've got some other information down here just for, for ease in trying to interpret your geochemistry. Now, when you actually look at the results, you've got tabs on the right-hand side here, and you can quickly click on those and look at you know, the zinc concentration. What you see in, in this survey, which is many thousand samples, is that there's one statistical zinc anomaly when you look at the whole or two, when you look at the whole population. However, when you start breaking that down by landscape types, and we have quite a lot of landscapes in this because it's a very big survey, you can see there's, by landscape type, there's actually now quite a lot of, or a number more potential targets, and some of them actually cluster together. You can quickly zoom in on those, like this, and you can see instantly, if you were trying to do this with a regular geology map, you're getting almost no information, actually no, no information for that. However, on the clustering algorithm here, you're seeing the different landscape units and how those relate. And all of a sudden, these ones in particular, even though they weren't anomalous on the whole, by landscape type, you've got a pattern through there. And you know, that makes a really viable target. And you can scroll, hover over them in, in your survey, and it'll tell you the concentration, the sample ID, which cluster it belongs to. And you can see quickly that there's a big difference between 600 ppm zinc and 116. So you probably wouldn't pick that 100 as being anomalous, but once you start separating it by landscapes, you, you understand that's really the case. And so there's a few other bits of information that you're getting out too. So you can click PCA, the principal components, you can click conductivity and pH and get a map very similar to this. Uh, this one is <coughs> total organic carbon. So again, you can start to see, well, are some of my samples carbon rich? So they might be artificially absorbing more zinc. Uh, that's probably a likely scenario. So it might allow you to cross out maybe this target down here is a false positive. All of a sudden we're starting to think much more about our information we're getting. And that, you know, brings me to sort of the, the end of my talk where I, you know, I want to highlight the two real key images that, that highlight most about why I think fine soil fractions have value. And that is, you know, the Wittgenstein diagram starting to think differently about your geochemistry, starting to gather more information and also interpret it differently than we have done in the past and make it easy to work with. That's probably need a diagram for that as well. And then the, the other one is, is the football field. So just remember when you're collecting soil samples, it's about the difference. The soils aren't all the same. And, you know, if you have clay rich soils, you have a lot more surface area than if you have a sand dune type material. So understanding that soil morphology and soil properties is really important to understanding your soil geochemistry for exploration. And I would you know, argue that in many cases, the fine fractions are probably a, a good first pass, um, part to start. And I think with the way we're packaging up some of the analytical um, outputs, uh, we're also making it easier for industry to explore more effectively through cover. And again, just thank the team that's involved in this project. There's a, there's a number of them. There's also a team uh, externally at Lab West that are, are working quite effectively in terms of improving our methods. And I'll just finish with the QR code there that you can scan and get to our website, which has uh, you know, presentations like this in some cases and a whole lot more information for, for those that are interested. Thank you.